Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is Income Verification for Low Income Solar Programs. This webinar is a presentation of the Clean Energy States Alliance as part of our Sustainable Solar Education Project. Our host for this webinar is Diana Chase. Diana is a program associate here at CESA, and we also have on the line some excellent guest speakers from both Massachusetts and California to talk about the programs in their state. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. You can expand or minimize the webinar console so that you can see the presentation full screen if you'd like to using the orange arrow that we've got circled there on the slide. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as they come in and we will get to as many questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. So to make sure that we get to your question, type it in early when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you a copy of the webinar recording and a PDF of the webinar slides within about 48 hours. And all of these webinar materials for this webinar and for all of our previous webinars are available on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars. So you can find all of that there as well. So with that, I would like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Diana Chase. Thank you, Samantha. As Samantha said, I'm Diana Chase, and I'm a program associate at the Clean Energy States Alliance, or CESA. We're here today to talk about income verification for low-income solar programs. But first, let me just briefly introduce you to CESA. We're a coalition of public energy agencies mostly state agencies from around the country, working together to advance clean energy. You can see our members here. We're presenting this webinar today as part of our Sustainable Solar Education Project. The Sustainable Solar Education Project, which is funded by a U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot grant, provides information and educational resources to help states and municipalities ensure distributed solar electricity remains consumer friendly and benefits low and moderate income households. The Sustainable Solar Education Project provides guides, webinars, and other resources. It also has a free monthly newsletter highlighting news from around the country on solar consumer protection and equitability. You can find all of these resources at the link at the bottom of the screen. As part of the Sustainable Solar Education Project, we're producing a series of, web of webinars this fall and winter on low and moderate income solar program design. Today's webinar on income verification for low income solar programs is the first in the series. Our learning objectives for today's webinar are to understand different approaches to income verification for low and moderate income solar programs, and to see how state program administrators implement these approaches in specific cases. Each of our three presenters today works at an agency that administers low income solar programs. They'll each speak for 15 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Today's webinar will run for an hour and a quarter. It will end at 2.15 Eastern Time. I'd like to introduce all three of our speakers right now. Glenn Baird joined the California Department of Community Services and Development in September 2015 to support the Low Income Weatherization Program, part of California Climate Investments funded by cap and trade auction proceeds. His prior experience includes working in the California Department of Public Health and the nonprofit sector as an executive director and fundraising professional. Glenn holds a Master of Public Policy degree from the University of New England in Australia. Caitlin Kelly is the Renewable Energy Program Coordinator at the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, managing the administration of the solar incentive programs. She received her BA from the University of Connecticut and her MA in Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning from Tufts University. 
Kelsey Reed is a project manager for Commonwealth Solar Program with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, Mass CEC. He has been with Mass CEC since 2014 and has led Mass CEC's efforts in the partnership with the Department of Energy Resources on the $30 million Mass Solar Loan Program. Kelsey has a degree in economics and physics from Bowdoin College and has previously worked in the field of economic and environmental research. And with that, I'll turn it over to Glenn for our first presentation. Glenn? Thanks, Diana and Samantha, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, share out some of our experience around introducing solar PV for low-income households and communities in California. Uh, firstly, a little bit about our department. We are the state's anti-poverty uh, department agency, and we partner with local agencies to deliver services that include the federally funded low-income home energy assistance program and weatherization assistance program, and the newer state-funded low-income weatherization program, or you'll hear me refer to it as LIWIP, uh, which is the focus of today's conversation since we've been able to use this program to extend our services to include solar PV and also solar thermal measures. Uh, and just briefly to get a plug-in for California's cap-and-trade program, which has recently been extended, uh, LIWIC is part of uh, the program uh, titled California Climate Investments, and that's basically putting cap-and-trade dollars to work in communities through a variety of agencies and projects, and particularly in disadvantaged communities, and that has a particular meaning here in California. Those communities are identified by a tool known as CalEnviroScreen. Screen which initially had 19 different indicators that included air pollution and socioeconomic indicators such as poverty. And that tool enables the Cal EPA to identify the top 25% of census tracts in the state that uh, experience undue burdens from those types of indicators. And the reason for that is that 25% uh, of California climate investments have to benefit those communities or initially had to benefit those communities. And to help reach those target, 100% of our investments uh, to date with LIWIP have been into those top 25% of burden census tracts. But above and beyond that um, threshold, we also introduced income and verification requirements as well, which I'm here to talk about today. So, um, sorry, just went one too far. I'll go back. So from the cap and trade funds, um, we've actually received 192 million to date over four years, and that has allowed us to allocate significant funds to solar PV. And initially, we made two funding awards: one to a pilot uh, run by LIHEAP agencies. So given that they are serving LIHEAP recipients, they were held to the same standard of 60% of state median income and, and the same verification processes that we'd implemented for our federal programs. But we also procured a statewide administrator, uh, Grid Alternatives, that may be familiar, familiar to many of you. Uh, and they, that uh, administrator also happens to be the administrator for the California Public Util Utility Commission's uh, solar rebate program known as SASH for single families here in California. And that has an 80% AMI uh, requirement. So in order to for us to take advantage of that opportunity to co-invest in eligible homes, we have reflected the, the SASH uh, eligibility. And typically for that program, uh, income verification is through tax returns, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And those programs, these two program administrators are extending into service delivery through next year uh, while we transition to a new program model. And we basically um, have created this uh, new program model and which resulted in our latest procurement for what we're calling regional administrators who are implementing a model that um, on a regional basis integrates energy efficiency measures and solar PV and grid alternatives is also considering uh, con continuing as a subcontractor under this program. But since we're no longer constrained by the federal LIHEAP requirements for the energy efficiency program, we, for that program, we've also introduced um, what we're calling neighborhood and categorical eligibility. Neighborhood means that if you're in one of the top 5% of census tracts, every house in that uh, community is eligible for our services. And categorically, categorical eligibility is established through uh, being a recipient of other uh, assistance programs. But we have not introduced that for solar PV, so we do continue to require income verification for solar PV. 
um, and restrict that to homeowners also because we do see the potential flaws of introducing categorical eligibility um, in those households since um, you know a certain member of the household may have categorical eligibility but if you're ignoring household income as a whole it, uh, it, it could be benefiting you know households that are, are quite wealthy even if they're located in the disadvantaged communities so at first we thought we would simply reflect the 80 percent of area median income and it was quickly pointed out to us that in some cases our existing federal standard of 60 percent state median income actually qualifies more households so moving forward we're going to have to maintain our, our own income eligibility guidelines that looks at households uh, by size and county and determines which is the more generous uh, income standard. So we'll be keeping that uh, income table up to date on an annual basis. So in developing the new model, we also revamped uh, what we call our eligibility and verification guidelines. And that leads providers through the uh, income verification process, including the forms that are required from applicants to, to state their household income and leads them through the requirements to uh, submit and gather a supporting documentation. And typically that documentation needs to be uh, fairly current um, within six weeks of the application in intake date, or in some cases, annual statements such as tax returns or award letters from public assistance program suffice. Uh, so uh, the guidelines kind of go through each uh, type of assistance and, and what suffices in terms of age of documents. Uh, we also um, have income calculation formulas in that just to help providers. Um, if they're looking at weekly pay stubs, you know, they're directed to multiply that by 4.333. Uh, and similarly, if it's every other week or a quarterly um, kind of income verification, we, we guide them through how to get back to that monthly income so they can compare back to our income table. We also have many sources of income that are excluded, so they're uh, itemized in the verification guide. But for um, uh, without covering you know each major income group in excruciating detail, I've just listed them here. But the guide does kind of uh, lead you through these various income sources, uh, whether to include it or not include it as income, and what is or is not acceptable as as backup um, proof for these various income types. Uh, all these listed here are counted as income, but you'll see. On the next slide, there's a couple of things like a one-time gift uh, or school grants and scholarships that are excluded from the total household income calculation. Uh, you'll also see that um, at the bottom there, the guidelines do also include requirements for uh, difficult situations where um, the, the income may not have uh, documentation to back it up or any partial documentation or someone may claim that they have no income at all. So we do have a self-certification form process uh, where if all reasonable steps to obtain the supporting verification have been exhausted, uh, households are asked, for example, if they claim zero income to verify how they meet their household expenses on an ongoing basis. And just to give you a sense of what the guide looks like, this is just one category um, that's covered here, disability, foster care, benefits, etc. And it highlights the uh, acceptable proof, the unacceptable proof, and in this case, also um, an exception there for VA benefits that are paid directly to a, to a third party. Uh, just to note some, some challenges, I referred to um, tax returns earlier, um, the new requirement for library participation does not include social uh, security number verification. But of course, if you're asking people for tax returns, they're concerned that um, you know they're passing over their social security number to to somebody, hopefully a trusted community partner. But um, you know, in this uh, day and age where people are concerned about immigration status, et cetera, it um, does pose difficulties. And we expect it to pose uh, more challenges moving forward. Um, more frequent challenges, though, include the utility bills, because often the utility bills in somebody else's name, so you need multiple signatures to um, have an application uh, proceed. Uh, so looking ahead, just to wrap up this program component, um, while I've indicated you know, we've adapted our uh, income eligibility and verification standards, uh, CCI programs now have a, a new mandate through what's known as Assembly Bill 1550. And that has identified uh, new definitions for the disadvantaged communities that I was referring to, and also low-income communities and low-income households, since there's now a 10% carve-out for those new 
uh, categories of um, ensuring that CCI funds are directed to those communities. Um, and they've come up with a different definition than the one we've uh, enforced today, which is 80% of SMI or 80% of AMI. So we'll have to adapt to, to that as well. But as you'll see, agencies have some latitude to determine verification. Um, so I suspect that you know our approach to full income verification for solar PV will will continue for this program moving forward as we uh, uh, hopefully get uh, supplemental funds in future years. So I did just want to quickly end with another of our lower program components, which is our multifamily energy efficiency renewables program. And this is an incentive space program for energy efficiency retrofits and solar measure installation for property owners. And we do have eligibility for the entire property in this case of 66% of dwellings at 80, at or below 80% AMI. And we have um, requirements for deed restricted uh, properties and uh, additional requirement if they have less than 10 years left on the agreement to sign an affordability covenant. Um, and this is just the first program year really for this uh, program component. So we've had about a year of projects and the focus has largely been on affordable housing. But the pipeline now does have market rate properties that are likely to proceed. And um, so we've identified kind of in descending order of preference uh, approach to verification for whole building uh, entitlement or eligibility for, for this program component that also includes a, a rent uh, affordability standard based on a 30% of, uh, of income calculation. So um, uh, I'll be interested to see how that plays out in practice as we move more into the market rate sector. So again, um, just to end with one of our appreciative solar PV recipients here in Sacramento on the last slide. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to share our department's experience to date, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Caitlin Kelly of the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. Thank you, Diana. Just, uh, okay. So today I'm just going to give a quick overview of the low-income um, specific incentives for the Massachusetts Solar Incentive Programs. Um, just a quick overview of our incentives. Uh, we do have the current, we have one uh, program that ended in 2014 called the Estric One Program. Um, we're currently coming to the end of our second program called ESREC 2 and we are in the development of the next incentive program called the SMART program. Uh, we've been highly successful in the installation of solar in Massachusetts. We've installed over 1,700 um, kilowatts of solar capacity. Um, access to solar is not as easy for low and moderate income families due to the high capital investment and credit challenges. So because of that, uh, we have increasingly focused on expanding access to low and moderate income residents and ratepayers uh, with each successive uh, permutation of our incentive programs in the state. Uh, just a quick overview of the evolution of the low income incentives for the solar programs in Massachusetts. Uh, our first solar incentive program was called ESREC-1. Uh, under that incentive program, really, we had no specific types of, of project eligibility requirements. All projects were equally eligible um, based on size, based on location. Uh, we really had no uh, project differentiation. Uh, you had the same incentive for a, a five kilowatt project as the project that was uh, five megawatts. So it really, there was no differentiation. We tried to change that under the ESRIC 2 program, which is the program that is currently ongoing. Under ESRIC 2, we differentiated projects uh, according to market sectors. So we had market sector A, B, C, and then a managed growth category. Uh, under market sector A, we did have a specific incentive for low or moderate income generation units. Um, so these were generation units that sent all of their energy to qualified low or moderate income housing developments or housing authorities. So this was either they were installed directly on the properties themselves or they had uh, virtual net metering agreements with the qualified housing authority. Um, we gave the highest incentive. Um, we have different ESRIC factors under the solar 
the ESRIC program. So we get the highest uh, incentive, and it was also outside of the capped managed growth program for large ground-mounted uh, installations. We are currently developing the next incentive program. Um, we actually passed the regulations this past summer. It's called SMART, or the Solar Massachusetts Renewable Tariff Program. Uh, it's a tariff-based program, which utilizes a declining block incentive structure. Uh, the base rates are set by the size of the project. But we also have adders to provide additional incentives for what we see as desirable types of projects, including low-income projects. So under that program, we actually have three different types of incentives focused on low-income project development. So we have a specific incentive uh, focused on small systems. Um, we have a incentive for low-income properties, and then we also have a community-shared solar incentive specifically aimed at uh, low-income projects as well. So under the ESRIC 2 program, um, projects that were eligible for market sector A as low-income projects were required to allocate 100% of the output through electricity or net metering credits to qualified low-income off-takers. And so basically under all of our programs, we are not actually doing the income verification ourselves. What we're doing is we are verifying that these uh, properties meet the eligibility requirements that we set forth. Um, so they either had to be established housing authorities uh, or they were private low-income housing developments that provided us documentation to show that they met the affordability criteria that we set forth. Uh, so they could obtain predetermination letters um, establishing that those properties were eligible as low-income off-takers. So to provide uh, more information to the market, we developed a guideline, and it's a guideline regarding the definition of low or moderate income housing uh, to assist developers in outlining the criteria for qualification. The basic qualification criteria was that the housing development had to have at least 25% of their units serving um, a population at the 80% of the area median income or 20% of their units serving a uh, population at 50% of the area median income, also known as extremely low income um, population. And it's the same definition that's used in our uh, affordable housing statute, uh, also known as uh, 40B colloquially. Uh, this is MGL Chapter 40B Section 20 is actually the specific definition that we cited. And that was based on the recommendation of the Department of Housing and Community Development and also uh, a number of commenters that were familiar with the, the low-income housing development sector. They suggested that we use this, this definition. So they had to meet the criteria that to qualify as uh, a low-income housing development. And then, in addition, the solar developer had to show a contract with that off-taker, with that qualified uh, low-income development for at least 10 years, which is equivalent to the 10-year ESRIC 2 term. So in creating the guideline on the definition of lower moderate income housing, uh, we actually did work with DHCD and with a low income housing developer on creating this guideline. <coughs> so as I said, we didn't do the actual uh, income verification ourselves. We just made sure that they were eligible subject to um, established affordability restrictions and programs. So if they provided any one of the following documentations to us um, to show that they had a set regulatory agreement, they had a deed restriction, a loan agreement, an affordable housing restric restriction, um, housing assistance payments or HAP contracts, um, so any of these documents. So under the ESRIC 2 program, what we were really qualifying was the actual property itself. Um, we weren't qualifying individual residents and verifying the income of individual residents. Um, we were making sure that the properties were enrolled in established state and federal programs or were subject to legal restrictions so that they had to have and serve a certain percentage of their populations and their residents that they themselves had to verify met the income uh, 
the income levels and were established as extremely low income residents or low income residents. And then under the SRC 2 program, um, the basically having low income properties being set at the uh, the highest incentive levels under market sector A um, and having no restrictions uh, on these large projects. Uh, we saw a large number of projects being built that served this community. So we had over 60 megawatts and 62 projects interconnected as low income housing generation units as of the end of uh, August of this year. And we do still have over 84 megawatts in the in the pipeline qualified as low income housing. Um, so really, what we saw being developed for these low income housing projects were uh, mostly large ground mounted systems that essentially had virtual net metering agreements with these low income housing developers um, for at least 10 years. Most of them are for 20 years. So we did see some projects that were built um, directly on site of low income housing developments and housing authorities. But under uh, this structure, we don't differentiate between types of projects that are directly on site and types of projects that are off site and utilizing virtual net metering. So really because of this structure, um, a lot of comments were submitted during the development of the next incentive program um, or the SMART program. And uh, comments praised the effectiveness of the low income housing incentive under SREC2 because we did see a lot of solar being built that was serving uh, low income properties. But the critique was that the while low income properties were being served, um, there was really no direct benefit directly to low-income residents themselves um, because the, the incentive and the benefit was going to the property owners rather than to the low-income residents directly. So we, we really thought about that as we were designing this next program um, and creating the incentives for low-income uh, project development under the SMART program. So with that in mind, um, under the SMART program, we are incentivizing low-income projects in two different ways. Um, so under the SMART program, we do have projects, uh, projects receive a base incentive based on their size. Um, and then, as I explained earlier, they receive additional adders on top of that base incentive. So the highest base incentive that we have for projects is actually for qualified uh, low-income small projects. So 25 kW or less, um, and they have to be eligible as low-income residents. We also have adders for uh, low-income properties and for low-income community shared solar. The eligibility requirements for the low-income property adder functions in the same way the low-income housing eligibility functions in SREC2. So uh, it's essentially the same criteria. We're looking at, okay, what is the the affordable, is it a housing authority that you're sending the energy to? Is it uh, a qualified low-income housing development? Um, so that's exactly the same way. And if they're eligible, they get the low-income property adder. Uh, for both the low-income small system base incentive and the low-income community shared solar adder, uh, since those are intended to provide direct benefits to a low-income rate payer, to a low-income resident, um, we're actually looking at uh, the resident themselves. So eligibility is proven by establishing that the customer is on their utility's low-income residential rate. Um, so in that, in that case, the eligibility is verified directly by the utility company. So uh, each utility company has a discounted residential rate for qualified low-income rate payers. So if they can show that they are on that rate class, then they would be eligible for the low-income small base incentive or um, low-income community shared solar. So for low-income community shared solar projects, uh, a developer must show that they're serving at least 50% eligible low-income off-takers in their list of off-takers in the community solar arrangement. 
So as I mentioned, each electric uh, distribution company has its own discounted utility rate. Uh, it's based on a number of things, but so if you look at the national grid uh, rate, which is called the R2 rate class, for instance, they say that you know you have to be a residential customer. Um, your housing income does not exceed 200% of the federal poverty level. The utility bill has to be in your name. Um, and then you're likely to qualify if you're enrolled in another need-based assistance program. Uh, so for instance, food stamps, mass health, uh, school lunch, et cetera. So all of these uh, federal and state uh, need-based assistance programs, if you are a customer of that utility company and you are enrolled in another one of these programs, then if you're not on the low-income residential uh, utility rate, then you likely should be. And in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact, if you are receiving any assistance through the Massachusetts Department of Transitional Assistance, um, which is the department that provides uh, food stamps, for instance, then you are actually automatically enrolled in your utility company's discounted rate class. So this is just uh, to show the specific uh, values that we're, we're providing for qualified low-income projects. So uh, for the low-income property, um, which I talked about, you get an additional incentive of three cents a kilowatt hour um, for low-income community shared solar projects, where you have to show at least 50% of the participants in the community shared solar uh, agreement are low-income. You get, actually get six cents, which is the highest possible incentive that we provide um, in terms of adders. So. You know, you can see based on the other adder values that we're providing, like we really are trying to get uh, solar development aimed specifically at low-income residents. And again, this is just to show you the value of the base rates based on the capacity. Um, so the highest value is for these low-income projects, less than or equal to 25 kW. So we have we have a method of setting these base rates, but you can see it's uh, significantly higher than anything else that we offer under the SMART program. So just the next steps, we're continuing to qualify projects under SRIC 2. Um, the SMART program will begin uh, sometime next year. Basically right now we have uh, set the regulations for the program, but it does need to go through a process at the Department of Public Utilities since it's a tariff-based program. Um, and so really, we won't see the impact of the change in the program design on the development of low-income-based projects uh, until the next program begins. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Kelsey Reed from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Hi, Diana. Thanks. I'll just wait for my slides to pop up. Uh, so I'm going to start out with uh, just a little briefly about MassCEC. Um, we are a quasi-state agency um, here in Massachusetts uh, with the goal of growing the clean energy industry uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, we do that on a, a number of fronts that our organization works on. Uh, we have in direct incentives uh, and, and programs focused on the adoption of renewable technologies. We have uh, programs focused on, on connecting employers and job seekers to so workforce development type programs, uh, as well as investments programs. And then we focus on the innovation sector uh, with a number of grants and uh, other assistance programs to help grow uh, smaller companies and new technology development. Uh, and as part of all that, and particularly within the uh, adoption piece, uh, we have a number of initiatives focused on, on the low to moderate income sector. Um, we've had a, a few grant style funding opportunities, um, kind of open RFP programs, the low income challenge in our acre program, uh, which were kind of bring us your best ideas for how we can support this market and we'll provide some funding to support that. And then we also have a have, have had and, and currently have a, a number of incentives or adders uh, to our incentive programs for low to moderate income 
uh, residents, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, we've had the Commonwealth Solar Rebate Program, which had a uh, income component um, in the past. We currently have the Mass Solar Loan Program, which is the one I'm going to talk about the most. Uh, and then we also have uh, our clean heating and cooling programs here, air source and ground source heat pumps, wood heating, solar hot water, uh, which all have a income component and uh, or an adder. And uh, one of the things that we focus on is we actually have tried to really align uh, the process we use for the mass solar loan program with the process we use for the clean heating and cooling programs so that we can uh, be consistent across the organization. Uh, basics uh, of the program we use, and again, this is specifically, um, we determine the eligibility for our income-based incentive uh, on the applicant's household income, and we do that using the, the most recent available tax return. Uh, with, uh, within that, uh, each of our programs to some degree establishes their own thresholds, and, and more importantly, the level of support they're going to provide based on those thresholds. Uh, and that's all based on the technology, the funding that we have for the program, goals of the program, and, and, and a number of other considerations. And uh, from a pure process perspective, uh, we have um, gone out and solicited a, a third-party income verification consultant uh, who provides the kind of income verification service. Um, so applicants for our incentive programs submit a request with this consultant, uh, which is a request to uh, receive a tax transcript from the IRS. The consultant compares that against our program thresholds and provides an eligibility letter. And I'll go a little more into detail on that in a second. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to note is that, you know, as we were developing this process and have refined it over the life of the program, we had a, a few different goals that we kind of focused on, uh, and you'll hear me refer back to these as we talk about how we got here, but um, making sure the process is simple and, and as easy as we can for the applicants and uh, kind of all parties involved, uh, making sure it's replicable and, you know, we're a program that's focused on the residential market and so we want to make sure we can do this the same way for each of the applicants that come through. Uh, making sure we're looking at this in a, an equitable light and we're um, kind of trying to treat the different situations that are out there equitably uh, and making sure it's accurate, um, both in that we have a high degree of confidence in the income numbers that we're, we're using and looking at uh, and also in that um, we believe that those income numbers and what they're meaning for eligibility are, are an accurate representation of uh, who needs this support. Uh, so I'm going to talk through kind of the thresholds and the considerations around that first, and then I'll go into the process and the considerations uh, around that uh, after. So this is for the master loan program. Similar to, to what Glenn does in California, we have a household size um, based model. Uh, we have two different categories for um, eligibility, 80% uh, or below uh, and 120% or below. We use uh, purely state median income. We don't use an area median income. Um, and then within each category, the kind of level of support we provide is different. Um, one thing to note uh, for kind of where we came up with these threshold values is we base it on the state median income used by the state LIHEAP program, uh, which is backed up in census data and updated yearly. Uh, we wanted to do that because we really wanted to find something as a backbone for our program that would then be consistent with uh, other programs in the state. And then, uh, as mentioned, we set this 80 percent and 120% category and the corresponding 30%, 20% uh, support that we provide uh, based on the, the goals of our programs and, and the structure and the technology that's involved, the um, target sector that we're really looking to help, uh, and, and a lot of stakeholder discussion that went into that uh, kind of early in the design of the process and trying to align those incentive values with the right markets. Uh, and just talking about some of the kind of many considerations that went into to figuring these out. Um, having thresholds based on household size, this is actually something that changed during the program itself. But, um, you know, we could realize that there was an equitability issue in uh, using a, a income based on household size and uh, versus just using a single average state median income. Um, and it's an important consideration to make. Uh, the consideration between statewide average and state median income or using the area median income is something that we've definitely considered multiple times. Um, and we erred on the side of using the statewide income going back to those goals and the uh, focusing on the simplicity aspect. Um, and it's, again, a, a balance there of that simplicity aspect versus getting the uh, exact right average to use in a given situation. Um, 
we uh, look at what thresholds uh, make sense for the program. Uh, is it 120% of median? Is it 100% of median? Uh, you know, on the lower end, is it 80% or 60%? Um, again, we've kind of established those thresholds looking at the technologies we were supporting and the uh, stakeholder discussions we were having during the design. Uh, and again, we wanted to also be consistent with what we do on the clean heating and cooling side um, so that across uh, our organization, we were looking at consistent values as well. Uh, and then finally, an, another big one that we considered is uh, income, even the right test exactly. Um, you know, there are other means or asset tests that can speak to uh, a household's ability to afford these systems, which is what we're trying to get to in the end. And so again, there was a, a real balance there between simplicity uh, in terms of what we look at uh, versus uh, the kind of accuracy and, and making sure that the people we're serving are, are people who truly need this. Uh, going on to the process section, uh, and this is the kind of a, a little more detail, but I'll still keep it relatively high level. Um, so this uh, income verification for the master loan program occurs during the technical application phase, which is uh, kind of the first step of the program. Similarly for our clean heating coin, it occurs kind of during or before their application phase. Um, we have a, a third party income verifier that we went out to our P4, and they have a online application that is filled out by the resident. Um, it's a name and address to the social security number and must be signed. And that's part of why we use this third party is a, a topic Glenn mentioned before uh, in that um, we know people are protective of things like social security number and income, rightly so, and so we wanted to make sure that this was done in a, as kind of a secure and independent uh, manner as we could. So we have uh, put that out to a third party who handles all of that for us. Uh, what that application actually does from a technical perspective is populates a 4506T form. That form gets sent to the IRS, requests a copy of that tax transcript for that customer uh, or resident. Our consultant compares the return form uh, against our thresholds, uh, and they issue an eligibility letter uh, to the customer and, and directly to us. Um, and so we have this customer's eligibility in our, recorded in our system. Uh, one thing to kind of note with this whole process, um, we we chose it in part because it provides a great degree of confidence uh, in terms of what income value is being looked at. You know, we, this is coming direct from the IRS. Uh, however, it also is a process involving the IRS, and there can be unpredictable timelines there. Um, we see even an average of one week, but there's uh, room for a lot of variability there, which can be a challenge from a, a program operation perspective. Uh, and then some of the considerations that went into that income verification process. Uh, what's the income value that the verifier should be looking at? And, and should it be multiple years? Um, we, again, have erred uh, on the side of simplicity in, in some ways, and that we look at only the most recent year available. Um, but there are certainly uh, considerations to be made about whether you want to look at multiple years or, or other values. Um, and also, are we looking at the total income or a gross income or adjusted gross income? Uh, we look at total income for our program because we, we thought that lined up best with the, the value that uh, would be reported on the census and, and therefore the values that were populating that state median uh, data we were using from LIHEAP. But uh, it's certainly kind of part of the discussion of making sure we're using the right income uh, as, a, as a comparison. Um, one of the one of the pieces of our process is that it's uh, a component that's driven by the the customer themselves, whereas uh, a lot of our other rebate processes are driven by the installers or the contractor. Uh, and so it's a question of how much can the installer help guide that. A lot of installers would really like to be able to provide a complete service. Um, other times, customers are very wary about sharing private information like social security numbers with the installer. So uh, there's a balance there that we wanted to strike. Um, and uh, a question uh, that uh, Glenn also looked at, but what types of other documentation might be allowed? Um, in some of our clean heating and cooling programs, we do accept um, an R2 rate code or a fuel assistance letter as uh, verification of an income under a certain amount. Uh, for the master loan program, we actually uh, go through this income verification with our third party for every applicant, and that's the, the sole way in. Um, and again, it's a battle, uh, a balance of kind of uh, simplicity and replicability and making sure we're kind of treating all these applicants um, in, in the same manner, uh, but also providing uh, the easiest path forward. Uh, and, and the other question is, are there other sources of income data that you'd want to be able to accept, uh, pay stubs or, or that long list that 
that Glenn was looking at. Um, there's a, a lot of different ways to get at this information. Uh, and again, we, we wanted to kind of establish a process that was really replicable and simple, um, but hopefully not uh, then limiting. Uh, and then the final piece I want to talk about a little bit is just that uh, our incentives did evolve over time uh, through our program. Uh, we, when we originally launched, uh, it was not based on household size. We had two categories in state median income. And, and the feedback, uh, part of the feedback we got early on in the program is that that ended up favoring a single person household over families. Obviously, a, a single person household who's making 100000 a year has a, a different ability to pay for these systems than a, a five person household who is making 100000 a year. So we, we ended up wanting to take that into account and move to this uh, household size based model. Um, uh, we also, at that time, uh, with that changeover, added caps um, to the incentives within our program. So we now cap that 30% or 20% um, incentive at uh, 10500 or 7000 for the various categories, uh, looking to be able to kind of serve more customers with that funding. We were seeing some of our larger products were really using that funding quickly, and, and we wanted to be able to provide assistance to more people. Um, the other piece is that we update these thresholds as new median income data is adopted by LIHEAP, so on an annual basis we update these thresholds. Uh, and there are uh, a number of challenges with doing that kind of during an active program, particularly with the first larger transition. Uh, there are people on both sides of that transition date, either who you know might have qualified and then don't, or vice versa, qualified or didn't qualify before and, and now would under the new structure, but they'd already applied. And there's a lot to consider with um, kind of making sure we're, again, treating uh, all of our applicants as equitably as possible uh, in making a transition like that. So. I think one of the, the recommendations we would generally have is uh, every piece of this that you can set up before your program launches is, is very valuable because uh, there are certainly challenges with transitioning during the program. Uh, and with that, I'm going to finish up and uh, look forward to all the questions. Great. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Um, we have some good questions here, and I want to encourage everyone who's, who's on the line, if you have any questions, to uh, type them into the question box on the screen um, so we can uh, get to all your questions about um, income verification processes. Um, the first question is for Glenn. Glenn, you spoke um, early in your presentation about income verification through tax returns, uh, specifically in the context of, of grid alternatives um, being the project contractor or the project manager, manager. You also spoke about using pay stubs and other documentation. Have you transitioned from using tax returns to using things like pay stubs, or are those both options that are simultaneously available? Yes, they are both options that are simultaneously available. Um, it's grids practice under the uh, SASH program, um, pretty much, I think, restricted to tax returns. But um, you know, we have always had uh, verification standards for our other programs. So when we integrated the energy efficiency and the solar PV program together, we, we wanted to be as comprehensive as possible and provide as much guidance as possible, knowing that um, you know tax returns may not be readily available, but last week's pay stub may be. So um, yeah, there's definitely flexibility in how you get to that uh, household income total. Thank you, Glenn. Our next question is for is for all the panelists. Have you encountered challenges with applicants providing household income verification documents? due to tech limitations, like, for instance, the customer doesn't have Wi-Fi or doesn't have a computer. If so, how were you able to help overcome those challenges? And I think any, any panelist who's had experience with that should uh, can just jump in and, and answer it. I can uh, jump in a little on this. Um, for, our, for our program, we, we certainly have had challenges uh, to some degree with that, um, particularly, again, because uh, Whereas most of our process is driven by an installer, this is a piece that does have to be done by the resident. Um, in a lot of cases, we do see the installer, uh, for the less technically savvy uh, folks, helping out with that um, process and, and kind of providing the resources to fill out that application. Um, our consultant that uh, provides that service does also have a, a kind of customer service line and, and uh, can facilitate kind of a fully paper uh, version of filling out that 
4506T form, performing the comparison and, um, and doing that all um, through uh, more traditional methods uh, like mail and paper or fax or things like that. So uh, it comes up on occasion, but we do have some uh, kind of availability to assist with that. Uh, I will say I've heard probably that is more of a, an issue when it comes to our utility bill information since we do require that for sizing of PV systems, for example, and unless people are, uh, you know, signed up for online bill payments, it's easily accessible, but, well, you know, they give access to the provider. Um, not everyone keeps their utility bills um, if they're, you know, paper bills. So getting that billing information is sometimes, I think, more of a challenge than the income uh, verification for our providers. Great. Caitlin, would you like to add anything? Um, we honestly haven't really run into those issues. We may run into them in the next program. Um, so we'll definitely be learning from, uh, you know, what Kelsey has learned at the CC and you know, Glenn's presentation. But we've mainly been dealing with property owners at this point, not residents themselves. Okay. Um, our next question is, how many income verification consultants are there? Is it a big industry, or do you pretty much have to deal with just one or two players? So I can speak to that a little during our uh, the RRP process. Um, I'm, I'm not going to remember the exact number, but uh, I want to say we got three or four uh, bids in for, for that open solicitation. Um, there were a number of different people out there who could provide the service. Um, sometimes they themselves are, are working with other partners, particularly where the IRS is involved. Uh, the IRS has kind of more limitations about uh, who can make these types of transcript requests, but uh, there are a number of providers who could then partner with, with those institutions that have that IRS connection that's needed and um, kind of provide the other uh, customer service or application service uh, that we were looking for. So we, we certainly got a few requests or a few responses, um, but it didn't seem like the, a universe that was gigantic. Okay, Glenn, and did I you have any? I don't believe, yeah, I'm not 100% I, I'm certain, but I don't believe that most of our providers would use any kind of consultants per se. I think most of the work is done by the boots on the ground, people that are doing outreach for, you know, the upgrades themselves, or even people who are coming in to assess uh, the home for upgrades probably have that role as well. So we do we do have a lot of flexibility for how people implement the program on the boots on the ground level. But it's, so I think it's really a combination of uh, different types of people who would be uh, performing the income verification. And then of course it goes back to, to, to the office for for uh, file maintenance, et cetera. So it's, a, it's probably uh, at the discretion largely of the providers. Our new providers are really just ramping up now. So I kind of put the word out to alert us to any issues that they're they're having. And maybe this whole idea of uh, tax verification may, may come up real soon. And we might have to look at uh, some most more, more uh, formalized procedures. OK. Um, the next question is for Caitlin. Is, it seems like your primary income verification method is, is to rely on the utilities rate class. Have you found any drawbacks to that method? And, and did you consider other methods of income verification? Um, so the utility rate class method is actually what we'll be using in the new program. So as that hasn't officially started and we haven't begun that process of doing the income verification with the rate class, um, I, I can't speak to um, how, how well that will work. Uh, part of the reason that we chose that method is because the design of the incentive program is such that the incentive is actually paid directly to the system owner by the utilities companies themselves. Um, so it's no longer a market-based incentive program. It's a direct tariff. And, you know, we did talk about, you know, in the, the design of the program, we did talk about other methods of income verification. But since the utilities have already done this work in uh, qualifying residents to be on the low-income residential rate, uh, we just figured it would, for for ease of process, especially since we anticipate uh, 
robust participation in this program, uh, we decided just to rely on, on the work that they've already done, since these are their customers that they're working with. Great, thank you. Um, my next question, the question was addressed to Glenn, although um, it's possible that um, Kelsey might be in as good a position or a better position to answer it. I'm not sure. I'll let, I'll let you decide. But the question is, um, what is the form of the contract with the income verifier? Is it per year, per resident verified, or what other criteria? Yeah, we don't have any such mechanism for, for verification in, in contract terms. We you know, simply uh, get them to adhere to our guidelines and, and maintain uh, backup documentation in, in the file. So again, it's, very, it's a very localized um, way of doing business rather than um, formal contracts with, with verifiers per se. For us, um, and, and we saw different options during that RFP process, so there were kind of a variety of ways of doing this. Um, the one we did end up going with is a, a per verification, um, essentially kind of per form filed with the IRS uh, fee. So it is uh, dependent and variable with the, the volume that we see under the program. Great, thank you. Uh, here's another question. It seems like there's similarities between what Glenn talked about with using disadvantaged communities as a as a qualifier and what Caitlin talked about with using entire multifamily housing um, buildings as a qualifier. Have there been any issues or can you say a little bit more about issues that might have come up with those methods of um, whether that's really a fair way to allocate low-income resources? Um, I could probably give a whole webinar on issues around disadvantaged communities, <laughs> but um, briefly, you know, it is it is problematic. Um, in, the, in the first rollout, um, for example, for energy efficiency, we were using our local networks um, that usually serve, uh, you know, on a county basis. Some counties had one census tract within the entire county, um, so it was um, quite difficult for them to 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 you know to uh, really invest the money because you know there are challenges with knocking on doors, and if you run out of doors to knock on, you've run out of doors to knock on, um, and you know it it has been pointed out you know the inherent unfairness of you know even multi-family properties. In our case, you you have two apartment buildings across the street from one another, and the census tract line runs down the middle, so one automatically qualifies and one is totally excluded for uh, at least the interim period. So we, we do, you know, experience difficulties with these kind of decisions, but, um, you know, this was a legislative mandate and um, we get direction on from the Air Resources Board and Department of Finance on how much of our investments need to be in DACs, and as I pointed out, to, up to this point, all, all of our dollars have just gone that, that direction with its... Uh, inherent challenges. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can certainly uh, <laughs> agree with everything Glenn just, Glenn just said. I think when we initially created the low-income housing incentive for District 2 projects, um, I mean, part of the reason that we, we designed the affordability criteria and the eligibility criteria in the way that we did is because, you know, we're we're energy experts, we're not low-income experts. Um, I mean, just kind of digging into this this world, it, it's extremely complex. Um, we decided it would, the easiest way to start out uh, to, pro, to design the program would be to use the established criteria set forth in Massachusetts statute for um, affordable housing incentives, uh, just which is the Chapter 40B that I referenced and the definition that they utilize so, uh, and also just when we were looking at these projects, the easiest way for us to qualify them was to look at the actual building um, because it's, you know, then we just had to say, okay, does it meet the criteria that we've established? Is there a contract for at least 10 years? And does the affordability restriction last at least through that 10-year term um, to make sure that it met? the definitions that we set forth. And I think part when we designed the further uh, low-income 
uh, incentives under the SMART program. Part of the reason was because, you know, we did get feedback that said, you know, there are issues if you just look at the, the how, you know, the development itself in multifamily housing. Um, you know, you could have a, a, a building that's 75% affluent and 25% uh, low income that would be eligible under the definition that we have as a low income housing development. So that's why we put the additional incentives specifically aimed to directly benefit low income residents um, and the easiest way that we figured to verify that would be through their utility rate, which is the R2 rate that we did. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, do any of your programs require specific storage requirements for the income verification proof documents gathered? In other words, how long are verifiers required to keep the records before destroying them? Uh, that is a great question. I know we have guidelines, but uh, off the top of my head, I'm, I can't really recall what the file requirements are. But um, you know, we do have monitors that do go in the offices of providers and check check their files um, on a, at least an annual basis. So you know, we we do monitor it and establish the procedures are in place. But I, I just can't recall how long they're required to keep all that documentation in the office. Yeah, I would have to second, Glenn. I uh, don't remember the exact term of that uh, off the top of my head, uh, but it is something that we, we have in that contract with that provider. Um, it's, in, uh, it's common in most of our contracts with a, a records require a holding requirement and not at cost. Uh, it's definitely something that's part of that. Yeah, Great. and I would just say, we, I mean, we don't work with an, an income verifier directly um, in the same way that Kelsey does, but if a project is qualified under our our program basically at any time during the eligibility term, we reserve the right to audit them to make sure that they are still meeting the eligibility criteria. So under SRC 2, that'll be at least 10, that's at least 10 years. Under the SMART program, that'll be 20 years. Okay, great. Um, the next question is specifically for Kelsey. Does the IRS transcript capture the appropriate income data for households that do not file returns? Also, must every member of the household complete the 4506T form? Are there complications caused by any of this? Yeah, so uh, to the first point, um, the 4506T form actually has a, a few different options on it. Um, one of the buttons or one of the kind of check boxes is I'd like to request my, my tax returns. Um, one of the other buttons is I'd like to request a, a confirmation of non-filing. So for uh, an applicant who, who doesn't file because they're, they, they're low enough income that they're not buying a tax return, um, they can still submit that 4506T uh, and it just returns a, a confirmation from the IRS that they uh, do in fact not file. Um, so we, we verify that through, through that method of, the, of that form. Uh, to the second piece, uh, we do require a, a 4506T form is filed for any member of the household who is over 18. Um, so for members of a household who are under 18, uh, that is simply counted and attested to by the, the applicant. Uh, and for all the members over, uh, we do have to, to file, um, which does add a, another layer of complexity, um, particularly if there are, uh, you know, students off at college or, or something like that who, who qualify as a household member. Um, there's some can be some complications there, and obviously, you know, it can mean more 45060s are required for kind of any particular project. Um, we tried to build that into our application system as uh, simply as we could, so that um, it, you know it's not an overdue burden, but it certainly is a a piece of the puzzle if the the applicant has to go in out and uh, you know compile four of these forms or something to submit. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is for um, any of the presenters. Um, do you conduct re-verification, and if so, how often and how? Uh, so I can jump in on that. We don't 
um, for our program. So we do one verification at the kind of time of application, um, and and that kind of declares the eligibility for that incentive for that project. Um, we do have some some time constraints on that uh, in terms of. Uh, how long the verification lasts for. Um, so in, in some cases, if the project ends up not moving forward and then they came back in a few years or something, they might have to go through the verification again. Um, we've also, we are able, if uh, an applicant applies and, and doesn't qualify where they think they were for that year or something like that, if they end up not moving forward with the project, they can come back into the program and reapply, um, you know, in a future year once their income is uh, below the threshold or something like that. So we, we have had a few situations like that, but once we issue that eligibility, we don't go back and check it. And I think for us, it would only come up with our new program that's now disassociated from federal utility assistance, et cetera, where they can come in subsequent years. Um, I could foresee a case where, you know, someone is qualified, receives our energy efficiency retrofits and, you know, may refuse solar PV even though they're a good candidate for solar PV and then a year later kind of come back and say, oh, I'd like solar PV now, please. Um, but that, I think, would be treated as a, as a reapplication and, and, and they would uh, have to go through verification again. Yeah, and same for us. The, the verification would happen at the point of qualifying for the incentive program. Um, but as I said, uh, we do reserve the right to audit and, and check on the eligibility of projects um, at any point during the term that a project is receiving incentives. So we don't we don't do that regularly. Um, we usually only do it at the beginning when a project is being qualified. But um, we just we make sure applicants and and uh, participants are aware of this. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, what is the best documentation to better understand multifamily in residents' income across its residents? Are there specific forms or programs to confirm this? Well, I think if you go back to um, my slide where I go over the documentation that could have been be provided by a private low-income housing development. Um, any ones of those forms of documentation um, could be provided to make sure that that property was eligible. Um, it was, uh, for most of the projects that uh, we qualified, uh, the most common form of documentation was uh, a HAP housing contract. Um, so, you know, they had to verify that a certain number of their residents were at a certain income level. Um, but I, I don't know if there's any any one form of documentation that, that's best. Um, as I said, that we actually worked with a with PHDD and with a low-income housing developer to create this list of, of um, accept, acceptable documentation because um, as I may have mentioned, you know, we we are, are solar experts. We're not low-income housing experts. So we just said if you provide any one of these documentation documents, then that would be acceptable to show that you are meeting these uh, income levels across the residency of the of the development. And for us, I think it's definitely something we'll be monitoring moving forward as more market rate properties come into to our pipeline. Because uh, as I pointed out, you know our guidelines uh, service plan kind of has a descending order of priorities, and of course, uh, pay stubs or tax returns are number one choice. But then, uh, if that proves problematic, the property owners and our consultant can move to public assistance program documentation for that categorical eligibility. Um, and then if that doesn't work, we have this, um, you know, uh, formula that is just based on the um, composition of the of the building, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments, and then uh, computing household size based on that standard and then applying that, that formula to, to reach that 30% 
uh, rent uh, kind of comparison um, against AMI. So if that is a go-to um, uh, formula in the future, I think we'll have to you know kind of critically look at why that's being used in the absence of uh, income or categorical eligibility because it's not not our preference to uh, go straight to that kind of uh, formulaic approach. Great, okay. And here's another question, and this is similar to a question that was asked previously, but I'm gonna ask this one as well in case um, the presenters wanna add to their previous responses. The question is, I'd like to hear more about the measures each of the agencies employed in order to engage low, I'm sorry, I apologize. The question I intended to ask, let me try it again. What safeguards are in place in each of the respective programs in the presentation to protect applicants' private in information? What practical precautions are recommended for safeguarding sensitive information, such as social security numbers, pay stubs, account information, et cetera? That's a great question. I, I, I know that um, you know this again would probably rely on local practices, but um, you know Grid's experience has been that um, you know they offer to you know black out um, those kind of references on the on the tax returns. Um, um, beyond that, I, I can't say that we really have implemented um, any any safeguards beyond the standard contract like language that says you know computer systems and file systems should be should be safeguarded basically, but um, uh, that, that's a good question. I'm not really sure what the monitors do when they go to the offices to check that uh, you know files are locked or only certain people have access to the files. I'm, I'm sure that is part of their protocol, but I'm not uh, not a monitor myself. So, and this you know this uh, links back to our long-standing practices around federal uh, our federal authorization programs that have you know similar requirements in, in contract. Yeah, and uh, just from our side, uh, there's a kind of number of things that uh, we include in our contract with that provider, um, you know, standard data security things and then some more applicable uh, data security protocols that we require, uh, certain Massachusetts privacy law and, um, and elements of that that we, we require uh, of kind of their processes. Um, I won't go into the full details of all that, and, and I'd have to look back at the contract to do so. But uh, uh, there's certainly elements of that that we definitely considered. Um, you know, from a kind of more practical or, or side of things, um, you know, we occasionally have these forms emailed to us um, from a, a you know a, an applicant who's not quite sure of the process or is looking to make sure or something, um, and and we kind of try and take that very secure uh, seriously, and and we fully double delete, um, you know, all those types of emails from our records and, um, you know, kind of try and make sure that we're, we're very careful around any times that type of information uh, is transferred to us. Uh, and then, you know, part of using that third party is that um, they provide all that securitization around their, their system and their process and uh, we just get a, a simple kind of eligibility yes no, um, which uh, kind of helps keep that all uh, confined to one place as well. Yeah, and we, um, I mean, the documentation that we collect uh, really doesn't have specific resident uh, private information. It's, again, more about the property itself. Um, and this is also part of the reason why, under the new program, we're going to be relying upon the utilities' uh, verification of an R2 status because, um, you know, they, they have a, a number of systems in place to make, ensure that their customer's information is kept private. Um, so we, we're really just relying on, on them saying yes or no, that this customer is, is an R2 customer or not. Okay, great. We have time for one more question, and I, I apologize to everyone whose um, questions I didn't get to. There were a lot of them, and there wasn't time to get to all of them. Um, I'm going to return to the question I started to ask a minute ago. Um, this is a question that could that could potentially kick off a, a several hour discussion. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to answer it, but but to keep it brief because we are just about out of time here. Here's the question. I'd like to hear more about the measures each of the agencies employed in order to engage low and moderate income residents in the program development process. 
what was most helpful to ensure the program would be designed to meet the needs of the target population. The whole question of community engagement is something that all of our uh, cap and trade funded programs are really grappling with at the moment. We, we're definitely trying to take steps to have a more um, coordinated and integrated approach to community engagement. Um, we are all required to, uh, on the cap and trade side of programs, to develop program guidelines and have a, um, a public forum, uh, you know, like a public hearing on our program guidelines. We kind of take it a little bit further in that um, when we do a procurement, we also try to uh, release a draft procurement and so people can, can see what the scope of work is, is going to be. So we do try to um, have multiple opportunities for uh, public input um, and you know conduct outreach around those kind of documents. But in terms of the, 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 the true community engagement where they're involved from um, you know program inception onwards is, is not been a um, you know major focus of, of our program since we have kind of piggybacked on our existing federally funded programs and that's really why we got the, the dollars to use them to uh, extend our uh, current programs but um, you know we do have a community solar initiative coming up um, we have workshops on that starting in uh, November 1st of November where we're trying to bring community partners together to develop the kind of partnerships for community solo success and one of our new uh, requirements in our most recent funding allocation is also to focus on farm workers. So um, I could see that being an opportunity for us to, to really engage around uh, a new program development as opposed to an extension of our uh, regular federal programs. Great. Caitlin, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I would, I mean, I would just say that we, you know, as for any of our programs that we develop, we go through the full public regulatory process, um, but specifically for the development of the SMART program, um, we actually had a, an extremely robust stakeholder engagement pro, uh, process even before we started the formal regulatory process with hearings and, um, you know, filing public comments. Um, we had probably a four-month process where we, we worked with, um, you know, very highly respected members of the low-income advocacy community um, in designing the program. So their income, their input was really invaluable uh, in terms of the program design and talking about the best way to truly reach and, and to help low, the low-income residents and to expand access for our solar program to the low-income community. Thank you, Caitlin. Kelsey, yeah. do you go, do you want to say something? Sure, I, I would. Um, I would actually echo a lot of what Caitlin said um, with our program because it was a, a program uh, formed in, kind of in partnership with the Department of Energy Resources and NASDAQ. Um, it also had a uh, a quite robust and, and long uh, kind of stakeholder development period with a number of uh, meetings and sessions and comment opportunities. Um, we solicited feedback, um, you know, both from our installation community and the, and the lending community we were looking to partner with, um, but also from, uh, uh, you know, some of those advocates for, for the low and moderate income communities as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's certainly something that went into, had a lot of input uh, during that formation period and, and continues to have input. Um, we, we welcome ongoing feedback about our program and we actively solicit feedback uh, from our participants in a, a kind of post uh, program survey and, and things like that and all that kind of funnels into how we, um, you know, developed our process um, at an organizational level. It's, it's also something that we are kind of continually focused on. We've uh, somewhat recently brought on a, a colleague here who is uh, really focused on the low and moderate income programs and um, is bringing a lot of uh, great expertise and connection to, to those um, organizations already working in that space. So um, it's certainly something that we continue to focus on. Yeah, we'll just Great. add that we've certainly engaged with our advocates as well. We have a California Climate Equity Coalition, which is a consortium of uh, advocates in, in the climate field, and uh, they're actually having a big uh, forum in Oakland today that I would have joined if it had not been for this webinar. So my colleague is uh, representing us at that, at that uh, forum today. Well, thank you, Glenn, for making the time to, to be on our <laughs> webinar today. 
I'm afraid we're out of time, so we're going to wrap it up here. I, I apologize again for not being able to get to all of the questions, and I, I do encourage people with unanswered questions to get in touch with the presenters directly. Um, I believe um, Glenn and Kelsey gave their email addresses in their presentations, and uh, if you want to get in touch with Caitlin, she's caitlin.kelly at state.ma.us. So thank you very much to our presenters and to all of you for tuning into our webinar today. I'm going to turn things back over to Samantha for some final words. Thanks, Diana. And thank you, everybody, who attended our webinar today. Um, as I said at the beginning, we will be sending you a follow-up email with links to the recording. There's some contact info and links where you can find uh, more info about us on the screen. But before you go, very importantly, we want to let you know about a couple of upcoming webinars that we have. Um, we have one coming up on October 19th. It's a follow-up discussion on today's webinar. This webinar is only going to be open to state and municipal officials. So it'll be a limited audience. Unlike most of CESA's webinars, this session will not be recorded. And we're trying to encourage frank discussion between all of the attendees. It will be an interactive webinar. We encourage you to sign up for this. Um, another upcoming webinar we have is on Colorado's Low Income Community Solar Demonstration Project. That's on October 26th. We will have speakers from a couple of organizations out there in Colorado who are doing some great projects. So you can find out more information about these two webinars and several more that we have coming up on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars. And that's it for us today. Thanks everybody for attending.